And that address will be uh, at the end of our talk on the screen. And so speaking first is my esteemed colleague, Dale Warren on the Empire State Building. He is an aesthetic realism consultant and an architect with over 40 years experience as a designer and project manager. He also taught architectural history at CUNY's College of Technology. And like myself, he is proud to have studied aesthetic realism in classes with Eli Siegel and is grateful to study now in professional classes taught by the Chairman of Education, Ellen Reese. Now, during this presentation, we invite you to submit any questions you may have via chat. And we'll take up as many of them as we have time for at the end of our talks. Dale Warren. Thank you, Anthony. Of all the thousands of skyscrapers that have been built around the globe in the last 100 years, is there any more famous than the Empire State Building? Yet like many people, I once thought of this New York icon more as the site of King Kong's last stand or as an engineering feat. For more than 40 years, it was the tallest building in the world. Then an important instance of architecture having beauty. Through my study of aesthetic realism, I've come to see this building as a work of art because of the way it puts opposites together, grace and strength, lightness and heaviness. And these are opposites every person is trying to make sense of, trying to put together in his or her life. And so as I speak about this magnificent structure, I'll be illustrating what is in this aesthetic realism principle. All beauty is a making one of opposites. And the making one of opposites is what we are going after in ourselves. In an aesthetic realism lesson I was fortunate to have with Eli Siegel in 1978, he asked me, Do you think the reason that you were taken by architecture is because architecture is at once graceful and massive or can be? Though I had liked drawing and designing buildings since I was a boy, I had never thought about this before. But when he asked me that question, I knew the answer was yes. As a teenager, I had felt anything but graceful. I had a lumbering, shuffling walk and a slouching posture that my parents often called to my attention. I was also awkward and self-conscious around people, feeling rather sure that everyone was looking at me and making fun of me. Meanwhile, I never thought there might be a relation between my feeling so ill at ease and the way I made fun of people in my mind. I was to learn later from aesthetic realism that when we elevate ourselves by lessening others, which is contempt, we'll punish ourselves in various ways. I came to see I felt heavy and stuck within myself because of the way I secretly got importance by making light of other people denying them the full weight I gave myself. The beauty of the Empire State Building is in how it asserts its tremendous mass in a way that is graceful, not overpowering. It seems to blend with the buildings around it in a friendly way. As I'll show, the mass itself has grace because of the form it is given. Empire State, designed by the architectural firm of Shreve, Lamb, and Harmon, and built by the Sterrett Brothers and Eakin Contractors, is a 102-story, 1,250-foot-high structure, which, on its completion in 1930, contained 2 million square feet of office space, 60,000 tons of steel, 6,500 windows, and more than 3,500 miles of telephone wire. One of the surprising things is that while this great building commands the midtown skyline, towering high above every other structure, walking down Fifth Avenue, you can easily pass it by unnoticed. And there it is, it's right at the corner of 34th and Fifth Avenue. Some years ago, when I worked in the vicinity, tourists sometimes asked me for directions to the world famous skyscraper. And on more than one occasion, I simply pointed straight up to the exclamation of the astonished visitors, for we were standing right next to it. The structure rises from a simple five-story base, which is quite neighborly in its scale, similar to nearby buildings, and actually smaller than many of them. 
and like them, its front facade abuts the sidewalk. But as we can see in this axonometric model, at the sixth floor level, the tower is pulled back generously from the streets on three of its sides and climbs gracefully in a series of well-proportioned setbacks that at the same time seem to visually buttress its soaring mass. Does this tell us that we can assert ourselves in a way that's graceful and proud when we want to respect what's around us? The Empire State Building appeal appears slimmer, less bulky than it actually is because of the elegant way its north and south faces have central recesses that extend vertically over 50 stories. These recesses give sculptural relief to what would otherwise be a large expanse of wall and the equally lofty shadows they create add definition, depth, and drama to the tower. Toward the top, there are additional horizontal setbacks. And as the floors diminish in size, there's a sense of gradual transition that we're slowing down and finally nearing the summit. But at the top is a final triumphant flourish as four powerful yet gracefully curving steel buttresses fortify a central cylindrical communications tower, which rises another 222 feet. Looking more closely, we see that each buttress is beautifully sculpted to resemble a bird's wing. So something visually graceful helps support something that's much more massive, the tower. And like the building below, this tower also has setbacks, becoming slimmer as it rises, giving it lightness and speed that draws our eye higher and higher until at the pinnacle, all this matter becomes sheer space. We've come to another related pair of opposites in the Empire State Building, heaviness and lightness. We can get a vivid idea about just how important a building's form or shape is in determining how heavy or light it appears if we compare photographs of the Empire State Building and a considerably smaller structure, the former Waldorf Astoria Hotel on the very same site that was demolished to make room for the mighty skyscraper. Doesn't this 13-story structure appear as heavy or even heavier than the 80-story office building? Writing about the opposites of heaviness and lightness in his historic 15 questions of 1955, is beauty the making one of opposites? Mr. Siegel asked a question that I believe describes what has stirred people about the Empire State Building for over 90 years. Is there in all art and quite clearly in sculpture, the presence of what makes for lightness, release, gaiety? And is there the presence too of what makes for stability, solidity, seriousness? Is the state of mind making for art both heavier and lighter than that which is customary? The state of mind making for a beautiful building may begin with the architect, but his or her design would never leave the drawing board or today the computer screen and become a three-dimensional reality without the minds and bodies, the hard work of many people. There are the structural, plumbing, mechanical, and electrical engineers who work directly with the architect. The contractors who plan and orchestrate all the complexities of construction. The workers who blast and excavate the rock for the foundation, who build the formwork and pour the concrete. The steel workers who forge the beams and who erect them on site. The bricklayers, stone carvers, window installers, plumbers, roofers, carpenters, plasterers, painters, and many, many more, from the foreman to the cleanup crew. This is true about every building, but it's a particular note in any discussion of the Empire State Building, which owes its existence to the efforts of the largest construction crew assembled since the building of the pyramids, at one point numbering over 3,000 men. 
The entire project from excavating to polishing doorknobs took just 13 months, a record time that has never been equaled for a building of this size. Speed is on the side of lightness, and it must have been a stirring experience to witness the steady rise of the building's heavy steel skeleton, which fortunately has been documented in photographs. And it rose at a pace that averaged four and a half floors a week. Later, when the exterior masonry was being laid, trucks lined up continuously all day, waiting for crews to unload thousands of bricks directly into carts that were immediately hoisted to that day's floor, where they were guided along temporary mini railroad tracks that wrapped around the perimeter of the floor, finally stopping to be unloaded right next to where the bricklayer was who cemented the bricks into place. Meeting this schedule would not, would not have been possible without the tremendous planning, coordination, and discipline of serious work in behalf of a structure so solid, stable, yet one that makes for such a feeling of lightness and release when you see it. I think it's the oneness of these opposites that has to do with the beauty of Lewis Hines awe-inspiring photographs of the Empire State construction workers. They look so lightsome, casual, and at ease, doing some of the most serious, challenging, dangerous work imaginable. These men were working on one of the very few active construction projects during the crippling depression that began with the stock market crash of October, 1929, just as the foundations were being poured. Despite safety precautions, 14 men died over the course of construction. It needs to be said here that as construction historian Aaron Rose writes, quote, most of the workers were Irish and Italian immigrants who couldn't demand higher wages. This was the era before labor unions in the building industry. Cheap labor was a major factor in the rapid construction of the Empire State Building. This was brutally unjust, yet I'm ashamed to say there was a time, I, it simply wouldn't have interested me very much. I once regarded manual labor so lightly and contemptuously as inferior to what I regarded as the serious superior work of the architect. The criticism of this unjust way of seeing that I heard studying aesthetic realism opened my eyes to the knowledge, expertise, and honest pride these workers bring to their jobs, without which the architect's design would never see the light of day. We have a beautiful need for each other. Seeing this was the beginning of big changes in me. A new respect for construction workers and what they deserve, including the fair wages and safer working conditions that unions have fought for and won for them. And I also have a new seriousness and ease working with them and other people as a team and really liking it. Now, in my work as an aesthetic realism consultant, I'm able to ask other men questions that encourage a way of seeing people, including people they work with, that enables them to be kinder and to like themselves more. We have asked, for instance, do you think you have a preference to see other people as more different from you than like you? The question is, is it true? Do you think you have seen your coworker, John, for example, as too different from you? And if so, can you also see him as against you or inferior to you? That may set your ego up for a while, but do you think it has anything to do with the feeling you described of not wanting to get out of bed in the morning sometimes? Could you write down every day one way John Lee is honestly like you, beginning with say, John and I both like to begin the workday with a cup of coffee. Do you think Mr. Lee has ever felt like that cup of coffee, that he can change too quickly from being warm to being cold, from feeling lightsome to feeling bogged down? Can you feel that way too? And in consultations, people also learn how opposites they're trying to make sense of 
in their lives are made one in art. For instance, one of the most beautiful ways the Empire State Building puts together the opposites of coolness and warmth, heaviness and lightness, is the way its somber and massive gray stone walls are contrasted and complemented by lively tomato, the lively tomato red color of the window mullions and the highly reflective stainless steel moldings around the windows, some with Art Deco detailing. And they frame the rhythmic rows of windows as they rise. These moldings, which rise the full height of the tower, glow and glisten as they welcome and reflect the ever-changing sunlight throughout the day. And at dusk are often magnificently ablaze with the reds and golds of the setting sun. The way the opposites complete each other here has a person feel a greater oneness of lightness, release, and solidity, seriousness. When people everywhere have the opportunity to study aesthetic realism, they will be grateful to know that the buildings they live or work in or just pass by on the street can be a means of making sense of the questions of their lives. So that is the Empire State Building. And now my colleague, Anthony Romeo, will speak on the Chrysler Building. He is also so an architect and has over 40 years of experience as a designer, project manager, and principal of his own design firm. He's also an aesthetic realism associate and teaches architectural history and building technology at CUNY's College of Technology. Again, you can submit questions by chat, which we'll discuss after his talk. Anthony. Thank you, Dale. Few buildings have had the kind of impact on the New York City skyline and the hearts of New Yorkers that the Chrysler Building has had. I remember it see seeing it from the back seat of our family car as we traveled when I was about five or six and made that impression on me and having a sense of awe. As an architect, I love the way aesthetic realism explains what makes a building beautiful and why it means so much to us. For example, this question from Eli Siegel's Is Beauty the Making One of Opposites? has in it the central reason for the beauty of the Chrysler Building and why it has moved and inspired people since it first graced the New York City skyline. Mr. Siegel asks about grace and seriousness. Is there what is playful, valuably mischievous, unreined and sportive in a work of art? And is there also what is serious, sincere, thoroughly meaningful, solidly valuable? And do grace and sportiveness, seriousness and meaningfulness interplay and meet everywhere in the lines, shapes, figures, relations, and the final import of a painting? People don't, the Chrysler Building says, yes, absolutely yes. People don't know how to be serious and lively at the same time. I didn't. Even as a child, I was often glum and humorless. My mother would say, here comes Mr. Misery with the weight of the world on his shoulders. And the reason I felt so good when I looked at the Chrysler building is, I was to learn from aesthetic realism, is because this towering structure does what we want to do, does what I want it to do. It shows that seriousness can be the same as lively, sportive, graceful fun. This building says you can be dignified, serious, and still be playful, even mischievous. In fact, when you're truly serious, that's when you'll be the most graceful. Conceived in the 1920s, designed by architect William Van Allen and completed in 1930, the Chrysler Building was indeed unreined and sportive compared to the more formal, weightier buildings of the time. And Van Allen had studied at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris and was influenced by the birth of Art Deco. Upon returning to America, he announced, no old stuff for me, Avanti, I'm new. Yet many architects at the time, it appeared, disliked the Chrysler Building. 
Van Allen was called the Ziegfeld of his profession. He was made fun of. And the New Yorker proclaimed that the building has no significance as a serious design. Even the respected critic Lewis Mumford described it as meaningless voluptuousness. Yet it is today one of the most loved buildings in the world. And where else could you find brickwork to look like automobiles? And the employment of actual hubcaps from 1929 Chrysler cars bolted into the brickwork right in the center of the tire where it belongs. Mm -hmm. At mid-height, where the base of the building becomes the tower, giant winged radiator caps, modeled after those used in 1929 Chryslers, and this is an example of one, accentuate the graceful outward curve of the building. And this brings exuberance to what might otherwise have been a heavy base. And from that level rises the graceful, beautiful tower. It is crucial to the beauty of this building that none of these elements seem stuck on. They fit amazingly. They seem to belong together. This is because Van Allen saw an authentic integral relation between two ever so different entities, the fixed structural solidity of a building and the dynamic gleaming attributes of a motor car. Above the radiator caps and hubcaps at the base of the tower, Eagles fashioned after Chrysler hood ornaments thrust outward like gargoyles of Notre Dame Cathedral. Then there is that majestic spire constructed in gleaming stainless steel, which crowns the New York skyline with exuberant noble grace. What is serious, solidly valuable is made one with the playful and mischievous. And isn't this what we want to do? In 1978, when I had an aesthetic realism lesson with Eli Siegel, one of the questions he asked me was, Do you like humor? I answered, yes, but it's interesting. I don't have much. When it comes to telling a joke or having a sense of humor, I can be very heavy. Eli Siegel saw humor as the, one of the deepest subjects and encouraged me to have a better sense of humor, including about myself, which I didn't have. For example, he asked th this in the lesson. Space and Romeo have what in common? They both have room for improvement. And so throughout this lesson, he showed with deep critical kindness and humor that I was, wasn't only different from other people, at times as I thought so much better, higher, more noble, and at other times I felt lower than a hubcap. I was related to every object and every other person through the opposites. When we see that the depths of ourselves are related to other things in the world, we feel honestly lighter. And Mr. Siegel himself, as I am grateful to have seen in the, in the classes I had the honor to attend with him, these opposites were magnificently one and no one could be more unreined and sportive but it was always at one with the greatest seriousness and meaningfulness in behalf of respect. And that is so in classes taught now by the chairman of education, Ellen Reese, whose beautiful humor brings out what is best in every person as it has clearly in me. The Chrysler building is truly distinctive. I think the most distinctive building on the New York skyline but it doesn't thrust itself forth arrogantly. Its slender proportions and gracefully tapering crown and spire seem friendly to its surroundings. It is bold, but not a bully. It doesn't go up after distinct, it doesn't go after distinction through the contemptuous lessening of its neighbors. You don't feel it competes with the buildings around it. The way you do the Sony building, which crowds its, its neighbors and is imposing and weighty, as you can see in this photo. Grace and seriousness are not one here. The arbitrary Chippendale top seems mocking. It lacks the serious, sincere, thoroughly meaningful, solidly valuable. The top seems applied. It doesn't seem to be an organic part of the building. And what Philip Johnson, who designed that building, said just that, that he just put that on top after designing the building. 
which shows an, a lack of thought, and, and including about the people in New York. The Chrysler Building stands out for a reason, described in this aesthetic realism principle. All beauty is a making one of opposites, and the making one of opposites is what we are going after in ourselves. And right up through the center of the building, three vertical columns of windows rise, culminating in the gentle arch echoed in the curves of the crown. Now the arch by its very nature accents upward motion while at the same time curving gracefully downward. It soars upward and has modesty, is grounded reaching toward earth. Now can we learn from this building about ourselves? Can we have stature without giving up friskiness and grace? And did the architect who designed this have respect for both aspects of reality? Now to take a hubcap and place it on top of a skyscraper is like saying, I'm going to elevate this seemingly lowly object so that you will see its meaning and respect it. Along with the up and down motion of the building, there are dark windows and with white bands of brick at the edge of each story, accenting the horizontal. So we go up, down, and out, accenting the horizontal. Ac uh, up, down, uh, accent, uh, up, down, and out. And the reason we're affected by this is explained in these sentences by Eli Siegel in Self and World. Well, the vertical line is a symbol to the unconscious of the self alone, the horizontal of the self going out. The up and down motion of a line is like the ego given to nothing but itself. The horizontal line represents the ego going out as an offset to verticality, unquote. The interplay of vertical and horizontal motion in the Chrysler Building has to do with its unique quality of being at once soaring and earthbound. But the most outstanding aspect of, about the most outstanding aspect of the building is its crown and spire. There is nothing like it in New York or anywhere else. <laughs> the significance of the crown can be seen if we look at some early studies of the building. Now, while both earlier designs accent vertical and horizontal in a way similar to the final design, they culminate in stodgy and bulky tops. Thank goodness they, they, they did not build it this way. Even with the liveliness of hubcaps and hood ornaments, the building would not be a beautiful relation of grace and seriousness without the crown Van Allen finally came to. Now, the spire has a history secretly assembled within the crown, it was raised into place one night to the astonishment of all New York and to the chagrin of those constructing what would have been the tallest building in the world, the Bank of Manhattan at 40 Wall Street, designed by Van Allen's former partner and now rival, H. Craig Severance. The Chrysler Building's final height, 1,048 feet, making it the tallest building in the world, or at least a year until the Empire State Building came along. It was not that competitive purpose or the desire to be superior, however, that made the structure one of the beautiful things in this world. It was Van Allen's desire to honor reality <laughs> by putting opposites together. The spire rises organically from the building's tower. The gentle curves on the crown accent thoughtfulness. They are graceful and reposeful. The triangular windows follow the curves, but accent playfulness and surprising critical energy. Now, fluorescent lighting was new in 1930, and Van Allen's plans to light the building were ahead of their time. They couldn't be implemented then. But some years ago, the original plans were found, and these triangular windows were lit up as the architect originally envisioned, surprising New Yorkers and bringing to that crown a new energy and spirit. In their liveliness, these triangular windows seem to mischievously contradict the quiet repose of those curves, but really they work together. The windows come to sharp points that shoot out in every direction. They would be too jarring without those curves. Imagine the curves not being there it would just be 
energy. And just as the curves would be too placid without the pointed windows. Together, the relation of liveliness and depth, energy and repose is what people are looking for. And one reason I care for my wife, Karen Bernatri, is that she can be thoughtful even as she is lively and funny in a way that criticizes my tendency to ponderous uh, sobriety. Now, when you look at the Chrysler building, you have a big emotion about the whole world. You feel earth and sky, matter and space join in a new way. From a base so solid and strong rises a spire that soars into space with dignity and playfulness. And I'm grateful to aesthetic realism for describing what beauty is and giving me and all people a chance to, know, to learn how these opposites, grace and seriousness, can be closer through studying one of the most loved buildings in the world. So, so thank you, Anthony, for that wonderful talk and uh, certainly made me clear about why I've cared for that building ever since I came to New York and love it still today even more. And uh, so uh, we're, we would invite people to uh, submit questions via chat. Uh, one question that uh, is interesting, I thought, to ask, and it um, has to do with the opposites. The fact that uh, I write about uh, heaviness and lightness in the Empire State Building, and you're writing about grace and seriousness in the Chrysler Building, and uh, someone would like to know, would, would you also say that, Anthony, uh, heaviness and lightness are big opposites in the Chrysler Building? Oh, uh, absolutely. They're, they're tremendous opposites. In fact, I think you could say that um, seriousness and, and, and lightness are, are definitely related. Uh, mm -hmm. Seriousness and gaiety are definitely related because as I said in my paper, I talked about how I was affected by being, I could be too heavy, I could be too somber. My mother said, here comes Mr. Misery with the weight of the world on his shoulders. And the reason I love this building is that it does put together something grounded, something substantial, even in the way the, what we, if we, um, Mr. Romeo, if we can go back to a picture of the Chrysler building. Yeah, no, that was, that was good. Uh, the full building, yeah, that's good. Um, because of zoning laws that affected both the, of the time that affected the design Mr. Warren uh, referred to as well, in the Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building, the way that we, we call it wedding cake design, the way buildings set back to allow more light and air into the street. Um, Dale described beautifully how the Empire State Building is, you have six stories and it sets back to give more of a, a kind uh, street presence. This, this, this too, you can see in the Chrysler Building, the lower floors, although they're much higher, and have a, a more substantial street presence than the, Christ, the Empire State Building, they, um, uh, it, it has that sturdy base. And then the tower rises from that base, giving it, and, and giving it which, is, which is more slender than the Empire State Building, in fact. But it gives it more, uh, that, that out of that, that heaviness rises this gent, graceful uh, tower, and then the spire itself, which is so, uh, graceful as well. So you have that going from this heaviness to lightness in, but it's not separate. They're not, they don't, you don't look at it as three different separate parts. And I know I could, could be that way. This is a oneness of those opposites. Whereas I could feel like I could be lively at some times, rare, rarely, and then I could be very heavy. And I never saw the person that was light and could joke around is the same person that could be heavy. I never put those two things together until I began to study aesthetic realism and heard criticism of how I saw those two opposites. So in art, we can see those opposites as one and learn from it. And that's the whole point of our, our talks. Um, and both buildings have it, but clearly uh, you can see that in the Chrysler building. Uh, thank you. And it's interesting too, uh, the same can be said about the Empire State Building in terms of the opposites Anthony talked about, about uh, grace and uh, seriousness and seriousness and playfulness. Uh, 
the empire, the Empire State Building is definitely not as playful <laughs> as the as the Chrysler Building, and yet, uh, as I as I showed some of the details, particularly that the uh, those window mullions uh, yeah. and the uh, stainless steel moldings around the windows that have that kind of Art Deco flair, uh, it has it has uh, that playfulness too, and uh, certainly. When they made the movie King Kong, they saw playfulness <laughs> as a potential yeah. in in that building. So it's uh, it that and 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 that's the great thing about aesthetic realism because it it says that in any in any work of art you'll find many pairs of opposites. How beautifully they're one uh, determine how great a work of art it is. How many opposites are there and how richly they're one. And it's and they're different. They're in a different relation in every every building and every work of art as they are in every person. And that's really part of the individuality of who we are is how the opposites are together in us. So, and meanwhile, as we're also saying in this, these talks, they're not always in the most best relation and they're often much better together in art than they are in our lives. And that's the great thing that happens in aesthetic realism consultations that Anthony spoke about. and also in lessons taught by Eli Siegel, that he uh, enabled us to see our relation to works of art and how we could put those opposites together in ourselves in a better way. Um, so another question, uh, someone is saying, uh, do you have an opinion about the various new buildings in the city that seem to be pencil thin? These two buildings seem to be a better relation of mass and lightness. Do you, what, what do we think about that? Do you want to say? Oh, sure. I, I, um, we can talk a great deal about this, but and, and just I look at them frequently when I'm, uh, you know, around the city. It's very disturbing. I do think that there's a, it's a, it's a good, they're a good example of, of lightness and heaviness gone awry, because because of their slenderness, they do accent lightness, but then the fact that they don't change dimension, there's there's also a certain kind of heaviness. And it's and it's precarious because you don't feel solidity of a certain kind. You don't feel stability. And let's be very clear, if you're living on the top floor of that building because of the necessity for buildings to have flexibility, they do move. And I I just feel that they don't give a person that feeling of security and, and they've certainly built safe <laughs> make, a, make a, a misrepresentation. They're engineered very carefully. But there is a, but architecture also has to give you a, a, a feeling of solidity, of stability, because after all, it's architecture. It's where people live and work every day. You don't want to be in a building where you feel that that relation of heaviness and lightness isn't secure. So it's a psychological effect a building should have on a person. And that's where, that's why, that I, so I feel that these buildings, they're sort of interesting in a sense, um, but the other aspect of this, of these are, are the, are they, they're really taking advantage of the profit system and the laws in New York that allow them to build that high. And really it's greed in my opinion. So if, if I don't, you don't mind my saying very bluntly, that there's a, a desire to make these luxury apartments uh, and many of them in a very small space um, at great cost and sell them at, at, uh, at great profit. Um, and I don't think they don't have the thought about the whole city and the, what we would call context that say the Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building have. Those buildings, those two buildings that we just, just talked about tonight, and this has to do with relation, our relation to, to the world, these buildings have a make the city better. Their presence makes New York City look more beautiful. I don't feel that about these sliver towers and these tall slender towers. And don't, by the way, Dale and I haven't even talked about it, so he might have a different opinion. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is I feel that um, rather strongly that it's the relation of heaviness and lightness accents the wrong thing. And it's, it's like we described in our papers where we could be um, too heavy at one time or too light at one time. I feel these have to do, these don't put opposites together. So 
I won't say two more. I mean, I, I generally agree with you. Meanwhile, I, I feel each each building has to be looked at in, individually. I do think some some are better than others, but I would say as a principle, I, I, uh, I agree with Anthony. Um, uh, another question, which I'll speak on first and then Anthony can add is, um, how have the principles of aesthetic realism assisted in your own work as architects? Which is a very, very important question. And, and uh, there's much to say here. Um, certainly uh, most important is that aesthetic realism through the, the, uh, the opposites, those 15 questions that Anthony and I uh, quoted from, there are 15 different pairs of opposites Eli Siegel wrote about in a broadside called Is Beauty the Making One of Opposites? And there are of course many more than 15 pair, but these were an important grouping of, of opposites that he looked at in relation to art, all art, all visual art. Uh, so we have a, through aesthetic realism, we have a criteria for judging our designs, asking, are they putting these opposites together in a beautiful way? Is this building that I, is this design I'm doing too heavy? Is it, is it insubstantial enough? Talking about the opposites of heaviness and lightness. So that's, that's one matter which is very important, but I would say just as important is that aesthetic realism has enabled us to have a way of seeing people, uh, which I talk about some in relation to the building of the Empire State Building and my way of seeing construction workers, and which was no good, but also clients. If, if I was a person who saw people as <clears throat> basically very different from myself <clears throat> and uh, it doesn't work too well when you're, when you're trying to work with a client who you're hoping to do a beautiful building for and one that is puts beautiful opposites together beautifully and functions well. So uh, much can be said, but when I heard criticism of the way I saw other people as too different from me and through the opposites, I saw that the people I work with, the clients that I deal with are trying to put opposites together too, like myself. There was a certain deep divide that was bridged. And I really, and I can't say enough how grateful I am for that. Aesthetic realism says every person is in a fight all the time between liking the world, which art stands for, and having contempt for other people and things to elevate ourselves. When I heard criticism of my contempt and I saw more that people were like me through the opposites, it was really the key to my becoming a more effective and kinder architect. So Anthony, I'm sure oh, you can I, add you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more and it, that's precisely what I feel. It's that I think principally starting with how I saw the world and how I saw people and the necessity for that to change. First, um, hearing criticism of, of my contempt in aesthetic realism consultations and how I didn't want it to dislike the world and how my desire to like the world and people was encouraged. First and foremost, that changed how I saw architecture. And one would never imagine that, but what you're saying is so true because I would never be able to be an architect or even teach architecture or care for architecture the way my life was going. I, I was simply too angry. I was too competitive. I didn't like people. How do you design buildings for people if you don't like them? And one of the things that I've learned is to want to know through aesthetic realism is want to know, to be interested in people and to see people in relation to myself and the whole world. And in doing so, that that's the first step toward uh, to being a better architect. Um, then there's the opposites and knowing consciously what beauty is and that every person is trying to put opposites together in themselves. I'm very grateful that the that from, from the first time I worked in an architect's office, I knew that all beauty is the making one of opposites and the making one of opposites is what we're going after in ourselves. And I remember when I met Dale Lauren, it was 1980, 1980. So we were both young architects. He had just graduated, I was still in college and we both loved the same thing. We both loved how aesthetic realism saw beauty and in college, uh, Dale went to Carnegie Mellon. I went to New York Tech and, at, on Long Island. I never heard that there was a relation between art and life. I never heard there was a relation between what you went wanted. I wanted as a young man 
and what a building did. And I learned in my first consultation, they talked to me about, is a building like a, like a person? Is a building one and many? Is it many? Is it many parts, but it's one entity? And are you one and many? Do you have you have relationships with 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 your family, with friends? At the same time, you're one person, and your relation you're an individual, but then you're related to the whole world. And it just changed my life. It was what I wanted to hear. I was looking for something, and I heard it because I didn't I didn't feel just architecture by itself was was just liking architecture by itself was enough. There had to be something more. And I met that understanding. And it enabled me to be a better designer because I'm able to be a critic of what I design and think about the opposites and how they're related to people and how what's kind, as Dale Lawrence said, is, is this building kind? And Mr. Siegel defined kindness as that in itself, which would like other things to be rightly pleased. So that is a conscious thought, even as we're thinking about what is right for people, we're thinking about how opposites can be one in this building and how persons like the world. So a lot can be said about it, but this is, thank you for the question. I'm not sure who asked it, but thank you for the question. Thank you. So um, there is a comment about the Chrysler building and a question. Uh, someone uh, asked, uh, uh, what materials were used in the spire? And, uh, and the comment is that this person loves the elevators and I <laughs> do too. And they certainly do put those same opposites together that uh, you spoke about in your, in your paper. So Anthony, you wanna comment uh, on those two things? Yes, I, I've often thought of adding to this talk <laughs> um, some images of the elevators and perhaps I will. Um, but first, I'll answer the question. They're made of stainless steel. Uh, the stainless steel is from Germany. Um, and That's the spire. The spire. Yeah, yeah, the spire is made of stainless steel. <laughs> all the elements, the gargoyles and the uh, hood ornaments are all made of the same stainless steel. Uh, very thin, in fact, and it was uh, um, uh, the, 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 pers the men that worked on the spire were amazing, tremendously skillful in what they did. Um, uh, uh, in, in building it, but the rest of the building is is, is masonry, brick, uh, on a steel skeleton, um, and so it's it's one of the it's they don't build buildings like that anymore. Skyscrapers like this anymore. What is amazing is using masonry, uh, uh, a brick building that has a certain intimacy because of all that detail in such a large building. Uh, using masonry is, uh, is really unusual. The banding, the colors, uh, all make it very unusual. So um, you know, that's... And, and, the, and I'll just say as a person who uh, I used to, my dentist used to be in the Chrysler building and uh, I have to say it was one of the reasons why I decided to go to that dentist <laughs> so that I could use those wonderful elevators. And uh, I, the... Uh, much could be said about them too, but they, they have they have that exuberance that the outside has, and they're they're done in a uh, what's called marketing, which is a series of different types of wood, both light and dark, and very exotic woods that are used for the cabs of the interiors and uh, the entire lobby. I would encourage. I mean, both both lobbies of both buildings are quite beautiful. The Empire State Building is also, again, it's a little more dignified. The, the Chrysler Building emphasizes more exuberance. But the, the lobby of the Chrysler Building is one of the few, not so many buildings in New York that have been landmarked. They're interiors. There are many, of course, thousands of ex buildings whose exteriors have been pre pre protected. But the interior of the Chrysler Building is so magnificent that fortunately it, it, is, it is a landmark and uh, in the original magnificent condition. So I encourage people to go take a look. Just to, brief, to add to that briefly, it, the, the interior of the, it's an interesting different relation of, of liveliness and um, uh, sportiveness and, and seriousness and get or gaiety um, in, on the interior. It has a great dignity too. Those, yes. that, that the, the um, the marquetry that Dale uh, mentioned is so exquisite. You're, you're mesmerized by the by the beauty of it, the craftsmanship of it, and um, there's it really is um, so warm and welcoming 
even as it's lively. And um, is a, there's a dignity to it that's sort of, you know, in a way, I'm not gonna say it's contrast to the building itself, but it, it doesn't just have the same kind of, um, uh, you know, spirit fun that the, you know, the gargoyles and the hubcaps, the interior has more dignity if I, if I had to say something. Mm. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think uh, th there's a, a comment uh, that I think arose from the discussion about the um, slender towers and someone is asking our opinion about uh, one Vanderbilt, uh, which is an, a, a new building that was just built uh, next to Grand Central. And, um, you know, I, I, I haven't had a chance to study it carefully, but I, but I certainly see it on the skyline. It's it's a building that is, I believe it's taller than uh, the uh, Chrysler building. I'm not sure it's taller than the Empire State, although it may be. It's one of the taller buildings in the city now. And I, I do think that it's um, it has interesting massing. It's not as slender. It's not it's not one of these uh, really skinny towers. It does it, and it does have massing, particularly at the top, that uh, diminishes in size as it as it rises and it it ends in a spire. So I would say, I would say where it's uh, successful, it's because it's. Uh, I think the architects have been affected by the Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building, and that and and their massing, um, which are unsurpassed. So I, I I'm not going to say that. Uh, that uh, Juan Vanderbilt is uh, unsuccessful. I think there's nice qualities about it, and uh, but I, I would still I would still <laughs> rashly stack put these buildings up against both of these up against that building. Um, and meanwhile, one of the one of the important things that's happening, the good things that's happening with architecture today, is that it's much more um, responsive to climate change and uh, this building, one Vanderbilt from my reading of it, it's a very energy efficient building. And it's and that's a very important thing that architects are more and more uh, aware of because, and I was shocked when I heard this studying uh, in recent years that um, buildings are one of the greatest uh, users of energy on the planet, even more so than cars. So the fact that, that this is much more uh, cognizant uh, among architects and, uh, and also being written into building codes as New York City is, uh, is now has an important energy code, uh, buildings now have to be built with greater energy efficiency and it's, it's all to the good for, for mankind. I, uh, I would just say again, add to what Dale's saying, I, think this is a building that can be thought about you know more but I too feel that it has it has beauty I mean the fact that it has the um, uh, the uh, sloping sides that go from wide to narrow and then and gradually and and what it is something like a, a spire or stepped spires that go uh, up to the top uh, to the sky there's the horizontal banding of windows that seem to go out. Um, and then they're, they're not solid glass. They allow light to go through them. So there's a lightness about it. Um, I mean, there's clearly the architects thought about how the building could be a good neighbor and how it could relate to the area around it and also to Manhattan as a whole. And that's an important thing that, that there's thought about a building, not just plopping a building down and thinking about your own yourself which we can do, you know, we can think about our own ego and, and how, how we're seen and not think about our relation to other people and how other people how should be seen. And that's a very important thing that we've learned from aesthetic realism. And I think architecture is no different. You know, when you're designing a building, are you designing it in a vacuum, like the Sony building, or are you designing it in relation to a whole city of buildings? And we're going to talk in, well, we've given many talks and uh, uh, in, in our our series and generally sometimes we will take up other buildings that uh, aren't such good neighbors and do show how a person maybe didn't think about the opposites as clearly as they, they could have and why that building is not beautiful. So I, I don't know, I think more can be said about this, but um, I do think it has beauty. So uh, I think we're, we need to close now, but uh, we wanted to 
again, draw everyone's attention to the website, www.aestheticrealism.org, and encourage you to go there. And there, there's wonderful things on that website, including other talks, including art talks on great works of art and, and links to uh, talks as well on, on music and even videos. Uh, persons take, discussing great works of art in different, different fields. And also, uh, you can just learn more about aesthetic realism as education in the classes that are offered uh, via, via Zoom at, uh, from the Aesthetic Realism Foundation. So uh, we're happy to have been here today, and uh, we hope to see you again. As Anthony said, we have many other talks that we've